Let's pray. Father, we, we do come to you as, as those who are hungry for truth. Uh, we come to you as those who sense our neediness. We come to you as those who confess that we don't always see things rightly. And, and we're glad that in your word is the fullness of truth. And in your law is the fullness of beauty. And as we read your word, Lord, that you are able to connect the dots between the truths that you're telling us and what we need to hear. And so I confess, Lord, even as I preach this morning, I don't know the stories of so many of who's in these seats, but you do, Lord. And so we trust that you will answer those prayers and meet people in the places that they need to be met. And you can do that far better than I can. So please, Lord, uh, help us even in this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, some I wrote, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I grew up watching the Cosby show. Anybody else here watch the Cosby show? Grown? I love the Cosby show. It's like one of those shows where you can watch the same episode over and over again and never get tired of it. Like, remember when Theo got the earring, that episode, right? Or the, the Gordon Gartrell. That's classic, that shirt when he put his... Anyway, anyway so it was... There's something about that show that I just loved. I couldn't get enough of it. Now, it's obvious that a big part of why we loved that show was Bill Cosby himself. I mean, his character was just so likable, right? He was funny. He was smart. He was a great husband. He was such a good father, just a good guy overall. And that's why when those charges started coming out against Bill Cosby, it felt like a complete shock to me. It felt like it was just so hard to, to make sense of it. As the details just kept coming out, I, I didn't know how to reconcile this image of this man that I had from this TV show with all that they were explaining in the, the news articles. I, I just couldn't understand. It felt like the, the difference was sort of night and day different. I mean, this man who made me laugh so much and really taught me so much about life seemed like he was living a dual life. And I couldn't wrap my mind around it. It was just completely shocking. It was so hard to believe. But you know what? While yours and my stories may not be the same as that of Cosby's, I think the idea of living a dual life isn't so foreign to you and me. I think some of us know very well what it looks like to sort of present ourselves in one way, but in reality be living in a completely different way. Like, for example, I think some of us sitting here this morning have a deep problem with anger. Like, some of, some of us are, we, we become verbally abusive by the things that we say. Or, or maybe you get physically abusive and... Maybe in public you come off as being sort of quiet and gentle, but no one has a clue what you're really like. Or, or, or maybe some of us right now, you're sitting side by side with your spouse in a relationship that's falling apart. I mean, literally, you were fighting on the way over here because that's sort of the tenor of your home. And yet you're putting on a show and no one in the world really knows what's going on in your lives. Or maybe some of us here, you know, we're obviously against things like human trafficking, right? We go to the events to fight against it. But you see, like, one glance at our web browser history would tell a completely different story. It, it, would, it, would, be, it would mortify us for someone to see what we're looking at. And you see, in each one of those examples, I think what we're seeing there time and time again is this, that sin causes people to hide. Sin causes people to hide. It, it causes people to pretend. It, it causes people to cover things up. It, it causes people to put on a mask. Because even though we deep down know that something is wrong, our tendency when we're in sin is to just hide. And so we find ourselves, we hide from people, and we hide from God. That's what we do. That's what sin leads us to do. And it's this tendency that we're actually considering together this morning. We're looking at Psalm 32, right? Now, this psalm is written by King David. Now, even if you're not necessarily familiar with the Bible, you've probably heard of King David before. He's known for a lot of great things, like fighting Goliath. But this particular 
psalm is actually referring to a really dark period in David's life. We actually get some context for what this psalm is about when we read another book in the Old Testament called 2 Samuel in chapter 11. And we read that when this is written, it's written in wartime, right? And so King David, he's a king, he sends off his army to go fight a battle, but he stays behind in Jerusalem. And it says that one day he wakes up and he goes off to the rooftop of his palace. And so he's walking out to the rooftop and he's sort of like gazing out onto the land. And as he does that, he notices a woman standing there. Her, her name is Bathsheba, and she is beautiful. And he's sort of like enamored by this woman, and so he decides that he's going to seduce her. So what does he do? He brings her back to the temple, and it ends up that he gets her pregnant. So when he realizes what he's done, you, you read the story of him trying to scramble to try to figure out what he's going to do with where he's at right now. And so he, he hatches this horrible plan. And the plan is this. What he decides is, you know, he's the, he's the king. And so what he decides is, you know, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is fighting this war. And so he says, listen, this is what you guys need to do. You put Uriah up in the front of the front, the front line, and when the enemy comes, you back off and allow him to be killed. That's the plan. That's what he's going to do because of what he finds himself in right now. And guess what? It works. Right? So think about that for a second. Not only does David commit adultery, he tries to cover up adultery by now committing murder. And it works. And so the husband dies, and David sort of tries to go back to living normal life now. And he's hiding this secret inside of his heart. But the story says that God decides to confront David by sending a man named Nathan who confronts him. And David comes clean, and he opens up about what's going on in his life. And you see, David, in response to what that period of life was like, he wrote two psalms, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. Psalm 51 was sort of the immediate, raw response to where he found himself. And Psalm 32, the passage that we're looking at together today, is sort of him looking back at that period of life and writing down what it is that he learned from it. And so the question we should ask ourselves is, what does David want us to know? as a result of that life? Well, I would say that this entire psalm can be summarized by this. So this is sort of the big idea for us this morning. That hiding from God will always lead to destruction, but hiding in God will always lead to deliverance. Hiding from God will always lead to destruction, but hiding in God will always lead to deliverance. That's what we want to consider together this morning. So we're going to jump in. We're looking at the first two verses of Psalm 32. I think it's um, page 462 in the Bibles in front of you, if you want to open that up. This is what David says. He says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Samaru, can I ask you, uh, who here wears either glasses or contacts? Anybody? A lot of us, right? Well, I want to say, even if you didn't raise your hand, I want to say that we all essentially suffer from bad eyesight. We all have bad eyesight. Maybe not physically, but we all suffer from this spiritual blurriness, I would say. Now, why do I say that? Because every single one of us fail to see sin for what it really is. I mean, you and I can live and we can be completely blind to what sin is actually doing to us, right? We can convince ourselves that living in sin is actually so much better. It's so much more joyful than living in God's forgiveness. Well, it's sort of like in these couple of verses, you know what David's doing? It's almost like, I can't even see you guys. It's almost like David is handing us a pair of glasses so that he can correct our vision. That's what he's doing. He wants to correct our vision so that we can understand sin and forgiveness more clearly because all of us have blurry vision. And so what does he do? He begins by challenging sort of a, a fundamental belief that you and I have about sin. Look at verse 1 again. It says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. You know what's interesting about that word blessed there? That word blessed could actually also be translated into the word happy. So you know what David is essentially saying here? 
He's saying, listen, do you know who's really happy? Do you know who really lives life with a sense of joy, a, a happiness? It's the one who goes to God with their sin. It's not the one who is hiding from God with their sin. You want to know who's really happy? It's the one who goes to God with their sin. Now, remember, this is David, and we just spoke about what he did, right? And so he knows both of those worlds all too well. And so he knows what it looks like to live in sin, and he knows what it looks like to live in God's forgiveness. And when he compares those two things, he's, like, he's saying, like, there's no comparison, right? The happiest times of my life were not when I was hiding in my sin. The happiest times of my life were actually when I was living in God's forgiveness. Now, when I say that, that has a tendency of going right over our heads. And so I want to ask for a second, if we could just pause and consider for a second, do you and I actually believe that? Do we actually believe that living in God's forgiveness is better than living in our sin? Because I want to say, maybe if we're being honest, a lot of us don't actually believe that. Or maybe I should say, maybe we even know that's true, but we don't live like it's true. And you see, I want to say, you know why that happens? Because that's what sin does. Sin causes us to have confusion. It causes us to have questions about the things that we actually know to be true. And so we start, everything starts coming undone. So, like, for example, right? One of the words that David uses here to describe sin, he uses the word transgression. Now, in Hebrew, that word transgression, it just means, it means knowingly rebelling against God. Now, consider that, right? It's not like David didn't know that adultery was wrong. It wasn't like, oh, he was confused as to what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. Or it wasn't that he was confused as to whether or not murder was okay or not. He knew exactly what was going on. But David decided that he was going to do it. And you see, that's what transgression is like. If I were to describe what the, the posture of transgression is like, it's like, I know what you said, but I'm going to do what I want anyway. I know what you said, but I'm going to do what I want anyway. You know, like, kids can sometimes be like that, right? Y you can say stuff to them, like, hey, bud, listen, I, I need you to stay right here. Don't go, don't go running onto the street. Now, they hear what you said, they understand what you said, but what's the posture? I'm going to do what I want anyway. But, I, you know, I almost want to say, I want to give our kids a pass, because us adults can be exactly the same way when it comes to God. In so many areas of life, we can know what he said, but we're going to do what we want anyway. Like, I know that I shouldn't be treating that person in that way. Or, or I know that I shouldn't be watching this. I know it. Or I know that I have no business going here. I have no reason to be here. I know it. But our actions are essentially communicating. I know what you said, but I'm going to do or not do whatever it is that I want. You see, we can be just like our kids. We can be just like David. And here's the thing. We do that because our vision is completely off. We do that because we can convince ourselves that living in sin is actually better, it's easier, it's more enjoyable than trusting in what God has said. But you know, the thing is, like, you and I have committed enough sin to know that the happiness of sin is, it's so short-lived, isn't it? I mean, we know that sin brings all kinds of shame, it brings guilt into our lives. It brings all kinds of consequences. It, it causes us to walk around sort of with the, the weight of sin all over our shoulders. And, and can I say, to be honest, that describes some of us even right now. Can I say again, God's word is not here for our entertainment. It's because he wants to sanctify us. Some of us are sitting here right now and we're actively living in sin. And, you know, maybe what you're doing is giving you glimpses of happiness, glimpses of comfort. But in all honesty, you know that you're walking around with the weight of sin on your shoulders. And that's why God wants to use his word this morning to, to correct your vision. 
And he wants to help you to see that the fullness of life that you're looking for, the happiness that you're looking for is not actually found in that sin. It's found in God's forgiveness. I mean, listen again to verse 1. It says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. That word forgiveness, it literally just means to lift and to carry away. That's the idea there, to lift something and carry away. Consider that, right? While your sin is actively trying to crush you, right, God's forgiveness is able to lift and carry that weight away. That's what it wants to do. It's sort of like this. It's like if you've ever been to the gym, obviously, I've been to the gym. You don't look like this by accident, right? <clears throat> if you've ever been to the gym and you're, you're, you're pushing weight, right, you're, on, you're benching weight, you know, maybe you first go and, and you start pushing and you got it, right? But then maybe after a little bit of time, you're like pushing this bar, right? You're pushing this bar and you feel like you're pushing this bar, but this bar is pushing down on you, right? And all of a sudden, like, you feel like, oh, I don't think I can hold this thing anymore. And this thing is getting really close to your neck, right? And you feel like, oh my goodness, like, I'm going to die in this edge fitness in this moment right now, because I don't know that I can hold this up anymore. Let me ask you, do you know that sense of relief that you feel when you feel like your hands are shaking, but somebody comes and spots you and picks up that weight and carries it away? God says, that's what forgiveness is like. You see, please hear me, Samar my road. Your sin seeks to crush you. It seeks to kill you. And in your mind, you might feel like it seems right or good. You might even think like your sin is manageable to you. Like, I, I can work around this. It's okay. But I'm saying to you, would you make no mistake about it? That sin is looking to crush you, is looking to destroy you. And David needs you to see that God's forgiveness is actually infinitely better than anything that your sin is able to produce. In fact, David wants to keep convincing you. So he keeps on going. Look at how he keeps describing forgiveness in verse 2. He says that when God forgives you in verse 2, that our sins are not counted against us. Our sins are not counted against us. You know what's interesting about sin? Sin is like building its case against you, right? It's keeping score of all the things that you've done wrong. It's reminding you of all the ways that you've messed up. But you know what's interesting about God's forgiveness? God's forgiveness is completely different than that. Because it says when God forgives you, he keeps no record of your wrongdoing. It's sort of like this. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but if you ever walked into a supermarket and maybe you're pushing a cart around, and you do this, you start playing this game where you, you try to throw things into the cart instead of putting it in there, you know what I'm saying? So you might like throw a bag of chips in there, it falls in, no problem. You throw a loaf of bread, you, it goes into the cart, no problem. And then you wanna get a little bit more risky and so you pick up a bottle of tomato sauce, right? And you throw it and the moment you throw it, it sort of hits the side of the cart, it falls onto the ground. There's glass shattered everywhere. There is tomato sauce all over aisle four. You're looking down, and you're just like, what in the world have I just done? Right? It's a mess everywhere. Now, imagine that you're standing there looking at this mess, and all of a sudden, from the corner of your eye, you see this, this attendant coming around the corner. And he sees down, he looks down at the floor, and he sees the mess, the broken glass, and he's saying, okay, you know what? Uh, I got it. And he's like, and you're like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I got it. And so then you, you pull into your pocket and you're like, well, how much do I owe? And he's like, hey, don't worry about it. We got it. Well, guess what? Somebody's paying for that. It's just not you. And you see, that's what God's forgiveness is like. We've done wrong. We've caused all kinds of mess. And somebody's going to pay for it. It's just not you that's going to pay. That's what God's forgiveness is like. And I want to say, listen, friends, if you are sitting here right now and you're living a dual life, if you're hearing the words that are coming from God's word to you, and even if you have sort of a, a mustard seed sized faith, believing that what you're saying is true, I want to say, please don't let that pass. Please don't let that pass. God is pursuing you. You should immediately ask yourself, what should I do? How do I pursue forgiveness in this situation? What do I do? And David would say, I'm so glad that you asked. Look at verse 2. David would say, 
That kind of forgiveness is experienced by those in, in whose spirit there is no deceit. It's experienced by those in whose spirit there is no deceit. In other words, the blessing of forgiveness is experienced by those who come to God with their sin, not by those who continue to hide. And you know, I want to say David knows that firsthand. Look at verse 3. He says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. I mean, consider that for a second, right? Imagine David's situation for a second. He's the king of Israel. And he's just committed adultery, and he's also committed murder. How does he just sort of continue on with life in that situation? Right? How do you go two minutes not feeling like overwhelmed by the weight of what he's done in the midst of what he's trying to do? But you see, that's what sin does, right? Sin causes us to remain silent. It causes us to hide. Let me ask you, right? If you've ever been around, around children, say children are you know, in the room next door to you, they're playing, they're having a good time, and you're sitting there and all of a sudden you notice, it's been a little bit, I haven't heard nothing coming out of their mouths, I haven't heard, what's going on? They're up to something, right? You know it, we know it. When we feel like, hey, there's something, uh, they were playing, they were active, and all of a sudden when they're quiet, we feel like something must be up, I mean, right? Let me ask you, who taught them how to do that? Who taught them how to do that? No one. It's what we do. It, it's what actually we've been doing since the beginning of time. Think about it. Adam and Eve sinned against God, and what do they do? They immediately wanted to hide. They wanted to hide. When we are in wrongdoing, our immediate thought is we want to hide, and we want to be silent. And again, I want to say you and I can do the same thing. Some of us are actively living in sin, but our, our lips are zipped. We're not telling anybody. Nobody knows about it. And why do we do that? It's because sin leads us to hide. But what does David say? He says that when he kept silent, his bones wasted away. He, he was, like, feeling uneasy with, the, with what he was doing. And you want to ask yourself, like, why was that happening? Why was he feeling uneasy with the things that he was doing? Look at verse 4. It says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of the summer. David says, Your hand was heavy upon me. And we should ask the question, like, whose hand? Like, who is he talking about? Well, it's God's hand. Think about it, right? Yes, sin causes things like pain and shame and consequences of all kinds. But I think it's important for us to realize that God, too, was causing David discomfort in this situation. Now, you might ask yourself, like, why would God do that, right? Doesn't sin, isn't sin the one that's caused, supposed to cause you all kinds of pain and hardship? And we're saying, why would God do that? Well, you see, as much as we want to ignore or hide in our sin, a good God doesn't allow for that. Right? In fact, the scriptures tell us that, that he doesn't allow his children to get comfortable with sin. In Hebrews, it says, like, you know what? The Lord actually disciplines those whom he loves. You want to know whether God loves you? You should know, hey, if he's disciplining you, that means he's doing that out of love for you. In fact, it says, if he didn't discipline you, you would be like illegitimate children, like those who don't belong to anybody. And so what I want to say to you this morning is, brother, sister, if you're sitting here this morning and you're feeling uncomfortable with your sin, what we should do is we should praise God for that. That's the grace of God that's intervening in your life. You see, he loves you and he won't let you destroy your life through your sin. In fact, I would say to you, the time to worry is when you're living in sin and it isn't bothering you at all. If you're living in sin, and you don't feel any problem with it, you should be very alarmed. It would sort of be like if my children ran out to the street, and I'm just like, whatever, do whatever you want. That would be the most horrific thing that I could do to them. We see, God leaving you alone in your sin is the most horrific thing that you, he could do to you. But thank God that out of great love for you, that he makes us uncomfortable. He loves us so much to make us uncomfortable. 
So much so that we can't keep on hiding. And it's actually the very thing that happens to David. Look at verse 5. David says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. See what's happening here? You see, David is so overwhelmed by the heavy hand of God that he, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. In other words, he confesses what he did. He just, he tells God what he did. And then he says, I did not cover my iniquity. In other words, he's not going to continue in hiding. He's going to come clean. He's going to come and talk about it. And it's almost like his biggest fear, the thought of coming clean, actually ends up being his biggest relief. His biggest fear of coming clean ends up being his biggest relief. You know, some of us refrain from confessing our sin because we're convinced that it's easier that way. If I just keep going, it's easier. It'll be safer, more comfortable. But that's because we're not seeing things right. Look again at verse 5. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I want you to notice that two things are happening here. David is confessing, and God is forgiving. David is confessing, and God is forgiving. I want to ask you, how much time lapses between David's confession and God's forgiveness? No time at all. Right? It's like it, it happens immediately. It, there's no delay. There's, there's no proving period. There's no terms and conditions that you have to follow. David confesses, and God forgives immediately. You know, when we hear that, it almost feels like it sounds too good to be true. Because, again, think about it. This is David we're talking about. He just committed adultery. He committed murder. And we want to say somebody after doing that can come to God and confess their sin and he's just given to you instantly? That's how it happens? That's how it works? And David says, yeah. That's exactly how it works. We confess our sins to God, and he forgives us of our sin. You know, I, I want to say the reality of this, of this truth that we're talking about, was actually shown to my wife uh, some years ago. I remember that I had done something in particular against my wife, uh, and it was tearing me up. It was tearing me up. And I remember I was, I had felt the, the heavy hand of God upon me. I felt the guilt of what I was doing, the, the, the shame of what I was doing. And I remember one night in particular feeling really convinced that I, I can't just keep living and hiding in this way. I need to confess my sin to her. And so I walk into uh, our room and I sit on the side of our bed and I, I just start talking. And I, I explained to her what I had done, and I explained to her how horrible I felt, and I, I told her how much I needed her to forgive me for what I have done. And do you know what she did? She didn't ask any questions. She didn't ask me to elaborate. She didn't want to know my reasoning. She just looked at me, and with grace and kindness in her eyes, she said to me, I forgive you. It was that simple. And she's never felt the need to bring it up again. She's never held it over my head after that. She forgave me completely and immediately. You see, to me, that is like sort of like an earthly reflection of what we're talking about here, this heavenly reality that exists between us. And David says, I confessed and God forgave my sin. And it happens immediately, completely. And if that's true, would you hear again, brother, sister, please hear me, the worst thing that you could do is to continue hiding. That's exactly what he says in verse 6. Would you read it with me? It says, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You know, if you're sitting here this morning and you feel the discomfort of sin, David wants you to know that there is a chance right now like right now for rescue. There's a chance for you right now to come out of hiding. And it happens, he says, through prayer, just by simply talking to God. You can do that by simply telling God that you're, you're tired of living this way. You're tired of hiding. You're tired of carrying around all this weight on your shoulder. Because you see, the hard truth is this. The hard truth is that 
there won't always be an opportunity for rescue. Would you hear that? Instead, there will come a day of judgment, a, a day when God won't be found, the scripture says, a, a day when great rushing water will come trying to sweep you away in your sin, a day when God and the godless will be separated forever. But here's what I need you to know. Thanks be to God that this moment right now, as you hear me speaking to you, this is not that moment. Instead, right now, this is a moment of God offering to you deliverance. He's telling you, he's inviting you, you can stop hiding, stop living this way. Don't make excuses, don't come up, for another, come up with another reason, you can come to me. Because God wants you to see, listen, true deliverance, true life is not found in hiding from God, it's found actually in hiding in me. Look at verse 7. It says, you are a hiding place for me. David says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. You know, when we're confronted with this decision, maybe you're sitting there right now and you're thinking like, hey, what should I, what should I do? Should I come clean? Should I be honest? Or should I just keep living this way? We can weigh the options and we can think of a, a million reasons. We might say, hey, if I confess this, what will people think? Or, hey, if I come clean about this, won't there be consequences? And so we go back and forth about whether we should just continue hiding or confessing. And that's because, again, I want to tell you, it's because you're not seeing your sin clearly. We don't see that your sin is actually like waves that are crashing up against you, trying to sweep you away, trying to destroy your life, trying to drown you in what you're trying to live in. Because in the midst of such dangerous waters, God says, listen, I'm your hiding place, not sin. Sin won't protect you. I will. It actually reminds me of that hymn, Rock of Ages. Write that first line. It says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. What's a, what's a cleft? You see, it's a space that you find by splitting something open. And so he's saying, listen, when the water of sin is rushing through, trying to sweep you away, he's saying, I will be that cleft for you. Consider that. When the water is so raging and it's crashing up against you, how precious is an opening in a rock where you can hide in that rock? And all of a sudden, the rock receives everything that was meant to be received by you. The rock protects you from being swept away, and God is saying, I am that rock. I'm the opening. The safest place for you to be in the midst of your sin is not in your sin. It's actually in me. And let me tell you, why is that? I want to be honest. It's not because being honest will be easier. It's not because being honest sometimes wouldn't have consequences. But we need to realize, we need to see clearly that your sin is trying to destroy you. Would you hear me? It's not your friend. And in the midst of your sin, God is shouting out words of deliverance to you. He's saying, the water is trying to sweep you away. Would you come and hide in me? I can be your protection. No matter what the cost, come and hide in me. So what does that look like? What does it look like to hide in God instead of hiding in our sin? We'll look at these last few verses and it will be done. Starting at verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. You know, there's a lot that can be said here, but just three quick words of application from these three verses. First, I want to encourage you, would you speak truth and speak, or sorry, seek truth and speak truthfully? I want to encourage you, would you seek truth and speak truthfully? You know, God, he says, he will teach you in the way that you should go, and he will counsel you. And, you know, the truth is he does that in a bunch of different ways. He gives us his word. He gives us his spirit. But he also gives us his people. And his people are meant to remind you of what is true. And his people are meant to be places where you can go and confess what's going on in your life. Remember, we don't confess our sins to one another because somehow we can forgive one another. 
We're not, only God can forgive. But we confess our sins to one another because it's so important. Because when we live with honesty and transparency with one another, it helps us actually to think clearly about where we are. It, it helps us to resist our tendency to hide. It helps us to, to see things that we're completely blind to. We're not even aware that this is happening. It helps us to grow in our love for God and even in our hatred for sin. Listen, I need you to hear me, right? I'm not at all saying you have to be open and transparent with everyone. I, I, that's a horrible idea. Don't do that. But I'm saying to you, maybe what I'm asking is, are you open and transparent with at least one person in your life? Like, is there at least one person who knows everything that's going on in your life? Is there at least one person who can ask you anything? They have permission to ask you anything about your life. And I want to say, if you would say no to that, then you're setting yourself up to hide. You're setting yourself up to live a dual life. Second, be open to correction. Listen to what God says. He says, when you're counseled, don't be like a horse or a mule. That's strange, but what, what does he mean? You see, what are, what are horses or mules like? You see, they don't just do what they're told, right? They'll resist and they'll put up and fight. And they sort of need to be dragged into obedience. And that's why they, they put on that bit in bride. I had to look up what that was. But it's that thing that you put around your head, right? The horse's head or the mule's head. It controls them. And so what David's basically asking is, listen, how do you respond to other people's counsel? When people tell you things, are, are you receptive? Do you find yourself rejecting the godly counsel of others? I mean, maybe if you're being honest, maybe people are even afraid to talk to you because they just know that you'll always push back. You'll always just be defensive no matter what somebody brings up to you. If that's true, I want to say that's a dangerous place to be. It's a place that leads to destruction. And God's saying, listen, don't be like a horse or a mule with that understanding. Be humble enough to hear from other people. Be humble enough to deal with your wrongdoing. And then finally, number three, he wants us to remember that God loves you more than your sin does. God loves you more than your sin does. Look at verse 10. It says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. You know, our sin really does blind us so much. Because the irony is that the very thing that we're hoping to receive from our sin is the very thing that God intends to give you through his forgiveness. Somehow, why do you and I, why do we run to sin? We run to sin because we're looking for comfort, right? Or we're looking for rescue. We're lo looking for love. We're looking to be accepted. We're looking for value or worth. But here's the problem. You see, sin writes checks that it just can't cash. It makes promises that it actually can't follow up with. It can't go through with. Instead, sin will promise you something, but will always lead you to, to sorrow and destruction. And that's why I need us. God's word needs us to see that the, the very one that you're hiding from is actually the very one that you're looking for. Or either, or rather I would say, he's the very one who has come looking for you. Some I wrote, I want to say, God loves you more than your sin does. Do you believe that? He says in verse 10, steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Steadfast love. You know, that phrase, steadfast love, is, is, it's this Hebrew word, hesed, that in English we have a hard time trying to explain, right? So, I, and it's interesting, I think, like, this Jesus Storybook Bible, like this kid's Bible, probably does one of the best explanations of what Hesed is. And this is how they define it. They say Hesed is a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. A never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. I love that. Do you know why? It reminds us of how much better 
God is than our sin. Because you see, your sin is a deceiver. It doesn't actually care for you. It will throw you under the bus the moment it gets a chance. It won't stand by you. It seeks to destroy you. But you see, God's love is completely different. He knows you. And even in knowing you fully well, even in knowing the sin that you find yourself living in right now, he still cares for you. He, he is faithful even when we find ourselves to be wandering. He has come literally to provide us with joy, not to lead us to sorrow like sin does. He has come literally to save the world from their sin, not to destroy us in the way that sin does. And how do we know that for sure? Because you see, there's no greater way that God could show his love for us than to allow his son to drown in those rushing waters of sin so that you and I could be spared from it. It's almost like Jesus stepped out from that space in the rock so that you can walk in. And he was swept away by the sin that you committed and you found protection. God allowed his son to be destroyed on the cross so that sin would not destroy you. You see, Christ was split open. He was made a cleft for you so that you can escape the destruction of sin by hiding in him. Samaro, would you please hear? There isn't a sin that you can confess that is somehow greater than God's love for you. And there is also nothing that your sin can provide you that is somehow better than what you have in Christ. And when you and I really believe that, when that sinks down deep into the crevices of our heart, it will free us to stop hiding. And so I want to close this morning by giving us a chance to, to even come clean. Again, we don't want to just be hearers of the word and so deceive ourselves. If, if God is speaking to you in a particular way, wanting you to deal with a sin that's going on in your life, would you consider that the great love of God, that you have an opportunity right now to deal with it? So I want to encourage us. Would we all just close our eyes and, and we'll spend some time praying? And, and maybe as we're sitting here right now, maybe, uh, maybe you know that you're living a dual life. And, and maybe in hearing God's word, you're convinced, yes, I, I need to come out from hiding. And if that's true, I, I want to encourage you, for some of us, we, just, we, get, we can just sit and talk to God. Remember what David said, I confess my sins to God and he forgave the iniquity of my sin. You can tell God, this is what I've been doing, how I've been living. Or if, maybe if you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't even know what to say. I, need, I, I would love to talk to somebody. I want to say there's, there's going to be pastors at the back. Please, like, we should keep our, out of love and respect for other people, keep our eyes closed. If you, if you want to go back and talk to somebody, you should go back there. A pastor would love to talk with you and pray with you. Or if you're saying, hey, I don't even want to get up, I don't want anybody to know, I would say as people's eyes are closed, you could raise your hand and I will come and find you after service and we can talk. And I would say, if you're sitting here and maybe in this season there is no duality in your life, if that's true, you should pray for the people sitting right next to you, that if they're living in sin, that God would give them the grace to come clean even in this moment. I want to give us just a few moments to be able to pray and seek the Lord together.
Lord, uh, we are praying that you would help us to see our sin rightly. Help us to see what sin is doing to us and, and how living in your forgiveness is actually so much better. Uh, even as we're praying right now, I imagine that some of us maybe we're wrestling and, and you know of the wrestlings of our heart. We're not sure uh, what we want to do, whether we want to keep on hiding or we want to come clean to you. I pray that you, would you give us confidence today? Would you give us confidence in the work that Jesus has done for us and what he has demonstrated to us on the cross? And in seeing the cross once again, that it would strengthen us to come clean about our sin. Lord, you have proven to us through the cross that you are for us. Help us to know that when we come to you with our sin, you won't reject us. You've paid for that. You are willing and able to wipe our slate completely clean. Help us to trust those things and, and come back to you again today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.